Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. There will be opportunities to ask questions during today's call. To ask a question at that time, please press star then 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may wish to disconnect at this time. I'll now turn the meeting over to Ms. Jennifer Smith. Ms. Smith, you may begin. Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Smith of the Census Bureau's Public Information Office. I'd like to welcome everyone listening in on the phones and following the webinar on their computer to the fifth installment in the Foreign Trade Webinar Series, The Fundamentals of Exporting. Today's topic is the ABCs of the Automated Export System. Census Bureau statistics are how America knows what America needs. As we continue to measure the nation's people, places, and economy, we are very excited to familiarize you with the Automated Export System. Our presenter today is Nadal Jubran from the Automated Export Systems Branch and the Foreign Trade Division at the U.S. Census Bureau. We look forward to continuing this conversation with you and the public, and you can keep the conversation going on Twitter by using hashtag foreign trade. This webinar is the fifth in an eight-part series. These webinars will take place every other Wednesday at 1 p.m. Each webinar is completely free and a great way to understand what the Foreign Trade Division does and the resources we offer. The next webinar, Your Free Tools of Trade, AES Direct, and AES PC link will be held Wednesday, September 19. Just a quick housekeeping note before we begin. Once our speaker has completed his presentation, we'll open the webinar for Q&A from the media and then follow up with questions from the general public. Without further delay, I'll turn it over to Nadal. Good morning. As stated, my name is Nadal Gibran. I am an AES client representative here at the United States Census Bureau. I, along with other client representatives, are here to support you and other companies who report to AES. Let me begin with a little bit about our division. The Foreign Trade Division is the official source for U.S. export and import statistics and responsible for reporting of all export shipments from the United States. The Foreign Trade Division is also responsible for writing and interpreting the foreign trade regulations. If you are searching for trade statistics, information on export regulations, commodity classification, or a host of other trade-related topics, this is the place to obtain the information you need. With that said, let's take a look at today's topics. For your convenience, we have organized this presentation into five major sections. The first section is a brief overview of the automated export system, its importance, and the different options available to you for reporting or shipment data. The next three sections focus on the procedures that we recommend you follow in preparing, completing, and following up with your shipment data. The last section is really the biggest and most important part of this presentation, AES compliance and fatal error reports. Staying on top of your shipment data and the filings, making sure you stay on top of your fatal errors and avoiding common problems. Our job here at AES is to make sure you get it right, and you get it right the first time. So, what is the automated export system? AES is a database that collects, processes, and stores all of your export shipment data. Anything leaving the country has to be captured in the system. AES is important because it is the center of your export transaction. The Foreign Trade Division is responsible for the collection and dissemination of international trade statistics, and AES is the primary data collection tool in that process. About 10 years ago, we were collecting approximately 500,000 paper documents per month, 6 million per year. Based on our analyses, every other document had some type of error or omission. With electronic reporting through the AES and upfront edits and validations that are placed on the data, the quality of data increased to about 98% versus 50% of paper documents. There are many other uses for the automated export system. The Census Bureau uses the AES for data collection purposes. Customs and Border Protection use it for enforcement purposes. The Bureau of Industry and Security and the Director of Defense Trade Controls uses the AES to track export license transactions. So you can think of AES as sort of a one-stop shop which serves all of your export needs. So who can file an AES? The United States Principal Party and Interests, or USPPIs, may file on their own behalf, or they may elect to have a third party, broker, or authorized agent file for them if a power of attorney is provided. 
let's take a look at the AAS process flow. This slide demonstrates how the shipment data is submitted to AAS from start to finish. The process starts with you, the export community, which is represented by the globe at the top left-hand side. Once the information has been keyed into the system, it is processed through a series of upfront edits and validations, then transmitted to the AS mainframe for further processing. At this point, AS will complete the processing of your data and will send back a response message to the original user. This step is represented at the lower left-hand side of the process flow. Now, if all goes well, you will receive the internal transaction number, or ITN, which is your confirmation that your shipment has been successfully filed. However, if the shipment data contains missing, invalid entries, or inconsistent data, other types of response messages will be generated. We will discuss the specific types of errors later in the presentation. Now, let's take a look at the various filing methods available to you. There are a few different options available to you when filing your shipment data. First, a direct connection to the automated export system, which allows you to connect directly to the AS mainframe. In that case, your company must apply to do so through the customs website, and they will assign you a customs client representative. This person will help you initiate communication to the customs mainframe. You can do this by developing your own software, by purchasing software from a certified AS vendor, or by filing through a certified service center. However, the most popular method of filing is through AS Direct. AS Direct is a free service provided by the United States Census Bureau to you, the trade. AS Direct users may submit their shipment data directly from our website at www.asdirect.gov. ASPC Link is a software component of AS Direct that you can download to your desktop computer also from our website. ASPC Link automatically links to a company's AS Direct filing account on the Internet. The software is free. With ASPC Link, you do not need an Internet connection to key in and save your shipments, so you can batch your shipments ahead of time and transmit to AS at a later time of your choosing. You may also use an EDI upload, which is a batch filing option that we provide. And finally, AS WebLink, which acts as a plug-in to your company's internal Internet software. It allows you to gather information from your computer and send it directly to AES. Instead of rekeying your information, AES WebLink interfaces with your existing Internet applications and passes that data to AES. Once you log into AES, you'll only have to key in the data you didn't already have in your system. <clears throat> now, let's turn our attention to some of the actions that should be taken prior to actually filing your shipment data. The important point that I would like to stress here is to gather your information. Gather, gather, gather. When you are keying in your shipment data, you will be asked for all sorts of information, so it is important to have it ready on hand. Examples of required information include the transportation information. What is the state of origin? What's my date of export? Where is the shipment originating from, and where is it going? And who's moving it? Parties involved. Each record in AES must have, at a minimum, a full and complete profile for both the United States Principal Party and Interest, or the USGPI, and the ultimate consignee profile. Commodity information. This is very important. What are you shipping? What's the Schedule B number? What is the value of my commodity and the weight? Be prepared to provide any license information if required. Okay, so in order to avoid duplicate filings, it is important to determine who is filing the shipment data. A US PPI may file the information on their own behalf, or an authorized agent may file on behalf of the US PPI. Please be mindful of who is handling this transaction in AS. In order to avoid duplicate filings, only one person or party may file for each shipment. Also, on the other hand, please make sure that at least one party is filing this transaction through AS. If you are the U.S. PPI and you send your data elements to your forwarding agent, make sure you follow up with your forwarding agent to ensure that the transaction has been completed. If there are third parties in this transaction, it's important to maintain open communication every step of the way. Now let's focus on some common problems that you may come across while filing your shipment data and ways to avoid them. 
Now, some of the most common problems that we receive at our help desk are related to misreported or invalid codes. Remember, as you are filing your data in AES, you will be asked for all sorts of information. You may need to do a little bit of homework to confirm that the codes you are using are valid and current. Some examples of some commonly misreported codes are carrier codes, sets of export, and Schedule B. Again, the Schedule B is your 10-digit commodity classification code. You may also be asked to provide any license numbers and ECCN codes if applicable. Research and report all required information. This goes back to my earlier point. Gather as much of this information as possible before you even begin the process of filing your data. Okay, so we walk you through some of the steps that we recommend you take before you file your data, ways to avoid common problems during the filing process. Now let's focus on the biggest part of our presentation, after filing your shipment data. So just because you hit the submit button, it does not mean that your job is over yet. In this section, we are going to discuss the follow-up procedures that should be taken after the shipment data has been submitted. We are going to hit on the various AS response messages which you will receive once you transmit your data. We will also discuss the two types of reports which will be mailed to you from Memphis, the AS compliance report and the AS fatal error report. But first, let's discuss those AS response messages. When you transmit your, sh your shipment data to AS, the response time is normally within 15 minutes and the responses will be sent directly to your email. In most cases, if all goes well, you will receive your ITN, along with any other responses which may have been generated. However, if a fatal error has occurred, then you will not receive your ITN, but rather a rejection statement and the reason for the fatal error. Let's take a look at the graphic up on the screen. The AS responses are organized into two groups. Basically, green means go, red means stop. If you receive any of the AS responses in the green box, your shipment will still be accepted and an ITN will be issued, and your shipment may leave for export as planned. However, you may need to perform some additional follow-up depending on the response. Any one of these responses in the green box may also appear along with your ITN. If you receive a fatal error message represented in the red box, then the shipment is rejected and no ITN is issued your shipment may not leave until this is resolved. Fatal errors are generated when something critical related to the AS record was not reported correctly. Shipments with fatal errors are not accepted by AS and an ITN is not generated. You must create, the, I'm sorry, you must correct the fatal error immediately and resubmit the data before the shipment leaves the United States. We will discuss the other types of responses later in the presentation. But first, here is an example of a fatal error message that you may receive after submitting a shipment through AES. Starting at the top left, the first thing you will see is a three-digit response code, which is assigned to the fatal error response. The next piece of information is the type of response, in this case, fatal. And next, the response message itself, the reason that you generated this message. In this case, the user reported an incorrect carrier code. The most, report, the, the most important thing to note is that the AES ITN field is blank. No ITN has been issued because a fatal error was generated in the process. The user cannot proceed with the shipment until this fatal error is resolved. In this case, the user would have to retrieve the shipment, modify the carrier code, and resubmit the record. If the carrier code is accepted, then the fatal error will be resolved and an ITN will be issued. So what happens if you receive a fatal error response after filing a shipment data? First, you are required to correct all fatal errors as per Foreign Trade Regulations 30.9. Again, if fatal errors have been generated, you will not receive an, an internal transaction number and your shipment cannot move for export. Appendix A of the AS Trade Interface Requirements Document, or the ASTIR, will provide you with a detailed description of each type of response message and their resolution. You can locate each message by, ref by referencing the three-digit number, which we discussed in the previous slide.
Now, as we said earlier, the most common types of fatal errors we see are code-related. Misreported carry codes, Schedule Bs, and ports of export, among others, are very common and easy to correct. If you do receive a fatal error and it is resolvable, please take the following steps. Retrieve the rejected shipment in your system. Correct the data in question. Resubmit the record in order to receive or to resolve the fatal error and to receive the ITN. When doing so, please make sure that you do not change the shipment reference number. Doing so will not resolve the fatal error, but you will create a duplicate shipment in AS, which may lead to additional problems. It is important that you never edit the shipment reference number when attempting to resolve a fatal error. In some cases, a fatal error cannot be resolved, and a shipment may be, I'm sorry, a suppression may be required. Suppression is a manual removal of a fatal error from your fatal error report by the AES staff. A fatal error may require suppression if it cannot be corrected, if the shipment was unintentionally duplicated with another shipment reference number, or the shipment itself never left the country for export. To request a suppression, please send an email to the address listed on the screen and provide a reason for the suppression. If you have received a fatal error for a shipment, and the fatal error cannot be corrected, but the shipment still has to move out for export, you may need to file a new AS record on behalf of this shipment. In this case, we will suppress the original shipment if you provide the following. The original shipment reference number, which received the fatal error message. The new internal transaction number, so we can verify that data has been collected for the shipment. Verify messages are used as a safeguard to ensure that information is entered properly and to limit human error and data entry problems. Verify messages are generated when the information that has been entered by the user falls out of range of what is expected for that data field. Essentially, each data field in AES has specific ranges and parameters hard-coded behind them. And when the information falls out of that expected range, the system will flag that as a possible human error and you will receive a verify message. It's important to note that you will still receive your ITN if you receive a, a verify message. But if you do receive a verify message, please do the following. Review the data thoroughly. If the data is correct, then no further action is necessary. If the data is incorrect, then you must retrieve the shipment, correct the data in question, and retransmit. If you receive repetitive verify messages for the same Schedule B number, you may request that a client representative from our commodity analysis branch look into adjusting the parameters for this commodity. In order, to, in order to do so, please provide the shipment reference numbers which have generated this verify message, as well as the Schedule B number and five or more examples within a one-month period of time with the same verify response message. Compliance alerts. Compliance alerts are generated when the user does something that falls outside of our regulations. The most common causes for compliance alerts are for, fi for filing late shipments or for changing critical parts of the shipment data after it has exported. Compliance alerts cannot be corrected once they have been received. This goes back to our previous webinar in which Omari stressed the importance of record retention to avoid these problems. It's important to document everything. If these compliance alerts become a frequent problem, please address your internal filing practices. You may also review our AS Best Practices Manual for additional help. Warning messages are generated when the shipment is sold en route, in which case the ultimate consignee is not reported at the time of export. This typically happens when a shipment is sent to an auction overseas and the individual who actually purchases the goods is not known at the time of export. You will still receive an ITN, but you will also receive a warning message, which states that the ultimate custody must be reported within four days. Informational messages. Informational messages are the least severe. These are non-critical notifications sent to you. Let's say that you are sending a license shipment under a DSP-5 license and the value of your license is now exhausted after this particular shipment, you will receive an informational response 
notifying you that your DSP-5 license is now exhausted. Again, this message is purely for your information, but it is still important to follow the instructions within the message to avoid future problems. Now, if a scenario arises in which you need to submit a shipment through AES, but you cannot connect to the system for some reason, there are a few options available to you. We will discuss two scenarios here and the options that are available for each. First, if the AES servers are down for an extended period of time, then you'll be notified by an email broadcast that the AES downtime is enacted. In this case, you may use what we call the temporarily AES downtime proof of filing citation to move your cargo instead of the ITN, which is provided by AES. However, in the second scenario, if the AES servers are not down, but you are still unable to connect to AES from your local system, then you must still find a way to submit a record of your shipment to AES before the shipment can move for export. You may attempt to find another computer to transmit your data. You may transmit directly to AES Direct, or you may select an authorized agent to report on your behalf. Just because your system is down does not mean that you do not have to report your shipment through AES. And please note, shipments which are subject to Directorate of Defense Trade Controls, whether licensed or ITAR exempt, cannot be moved under AES downtime. Licensable shipments cannot be cleared without a valid ITN. So, if the AES servers are down for an extended period of time, as in our first scenario, and AES downtime has been enacted, this is the AES downtime proof of filing citation you will provide. The format for this citation goes as follows. The text, AES down, followed by the filer ID and the date of export. It is important to maintain a log of all of these unreported shipments because you will be expected to transmit all of these records through AES once the system is back online. So once you've transmitted your shipment data through AES, you will need to provide a proof of your reporting to either your forwarder, carrier, or others involved in the export transaction. The ITN is the proof of filing citation. This is a 14-digit number. The first eight digits are timestamped with the actual date of filing, starting with the four-digit year, two-digit month, and two-digit date. The final six digits are a unique sequence identification number assigned to your shipment. So in this example, this shipment was originally filed August 16, 2012. Now, in our previous webinar, we talked about exemptions. Here are two common exemptions you may use if you do not need to file an AS. We have our low-value exemptions, no EI 30.37A, provided that the commodity is less than $2,500 and the commodity is not licensable. And we also have our Canada exemption, no EI 30.36A, provided that the commodity is not licensable. Now, some of you may be approved for post-departure. If this is the case, then you will use the following format as your proof of filing citation. And again, this only applies to option four post-departure filers. If the authorized agent files on behalf of the USCBI, you will use the text AES post, followed by the USBI and the filer ID separated by a dash and the date of export. If the USPBI files directly to AES, you will use the text AES post followed by the USGPI ID and the date of export. Ensuring compliance with AES. It is important that you may remain in compliance with AES reporting. Shipment data are monitored for quality and timeliness. Census will take the appropriate action to improve compliance if necessary. AES filers may be penalized for consistently falling out of compliance. Examples include failure to file, late filing, and providing false or misleading information. In the next slides, we will discuss the AES compliance and AES fatal error reports, which we provide in order to assist you in keeping track of and monitoring your AES activity and to help you stay in compliance with AES. 
Our AES compliance reports are sent out monthly, usually within the first week of every month. The compliance report captures all AES responses which have been generated for all of your shipments during that reporting month, including AES compliance alerts and unresolved fatal errors. It is important to note that unresolved fatal errors will be calculated into your compliance rate, so fatal errors will have a direct impact on your compliance rate. Your ultimate goal is a 100% compliance rate. Since compliance alerts and fatal errors will directly impact your compliance rate, it is best to keep these to a minimum. Furthermore, shipments found out of compliance are subject to fines, penalties, and seizures. If your compliance rate falls below 100%, you will need to take a look at your filing practices and address any issues or business practices which may be contributing to poor compliance with AS. Examples of these may include communication problems within your offices, delayed AS submissions from staff, and not verifying the corresponding information. Filers with few or no fatal errors and compliance alerts will continue to see similar compliance rates each month in their report. To maintain a high compliance rate, filers should do the following. Ensure that the AES compliance and AES fatal error reports are sent to the appropriate person in your company. If nobody is receiving your monthly compliance reports, please notify us. Minimize the total number of monthly AES compliance alerts. Monitor and resolve any outstanding fatal errors as soon as they are received. Properly suppress or resubmit rejected shipments and become familiar with Appendix A, Commodity Filing Response Messages, in order to find the resolutions to correct fatal errors as well as other responses. Okay, so now I would like to turn your attention to some additional training tools provided to you by the Foreign Trade Division. The Foreign Trade Division offers these additional training tools for anyone involved in the export process. We have 25 export training videos covering useful topics such as the AES and the foreign trade regulations. We also have an instructional video on the Schedule B search tool. Our webinars provide more detailed guidance and demonstrations regarding these topics. The Global Reach blog, which is available at globalreach.blogs.census.gov. This is where we post trade-related articles including information about upcoming training and best practices. So this concludes my presentation. It has been a pleasure to present the ABCs of AS to you today. Thank you very much for your time. I will now hand it back to Jennifer. Thanks, Nadal. Before we begin the question and answer portion, I just wanted to remind everyone we have a new mobile app available that provides statistics from 16 key economic indicators from the Census Bureau, Bureau of Economic Analysis, and Bureau of Labor Statistics. It is available for both Android and Apple devices. You can visit www.census.gov mobile for more information and to download the app. We'll now open the session to questions. Just a reminder that we will be taking questions from the media first and then follow up with questions from the general public. We ask that you state your name and media affiliation or company when you ask a question. We want to give everyone an opportunity to ask a question, so we will allow one question and one follow-up. And while we're waiting for people to ready themselves in the queue to ask questions, I just want to provide additional contact information. After the webinar, for more information, media can dial our public information office at 301-763-3030 or if you're the general public, please contact the Foreign Trade Division call center directly by dialing 1-800-549-0595. Operator, do you have any questions? If you would like to ask a question, please press star then 1. Please unmute your phone and record your name clearly when prompted. Your name is required to introduce your question. To withdraw your request, press star then 2. Once again, if you do have a question, please press star then 1. One moment, please. And then while we're waiting for questions to queue up, just um, 
you can see our upcoming webinars um, on this slide. Um, the next one is September 19. It is on your free tools of trade, AES Direct and AES PC link. You can register for, for it um, at the link at the top of the page starting Monday, September 10. And today's archived webinar will be available within 24 hours and can be found on our online press kit at www.census.gov. Our first question comes from Amy Beaudry, Azimuth Incorporated. Please ask your question. Actually, I think she may have just answered it. I was wondering if the material slides from today were going to be made available. Yes, the, um, the slides should be up um, now on the press kit page, and within 24 hours, the archive webinar will be there as well. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Antonio Suarez. Mr. Suarez, please state your company name. Yes, BE Aerospace Consumables Management, Wichita, Kansas. Uh, half, okay. of, half of the question was answered, but I, I do like to uh, make a hard copy of this so we can move it around from station to station. Will that be available? I was trying to print this, and it won't let me right now. From our press kit page, you should be able to print it. Um, if you go to census.gov and click on the slider, it'll take you to the page where there will be a PDF of the slides you can print. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sean Jankowski, Air Liquid Electronics US LP. You may ask your question. Yeah, I, uh, controlled products is with an ECCN that's uh, not EAR99, and we have a license exception, and they're under $2,500. Do we still need to file an AES filing? Uh, no, you do not. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Todd Smith, Haynes Brands Incorporated. Please ask your question. Hi. If we uh, have a question that we've asked various parties, we never have gotten a uh, complete answer. We sometimes export equipment that has more than one ECCN number. In other words, the same item has two ECCN numbers. That's because there's an ECCN number to cover the hardware and there's a separate ECCN number to cover the embedded firmware or software. But the AES system, when you're using AES Direct or whatever software system you're using only allows one ECCN number. How do you overcome that? Hi, uh, this is Omari Wooden, Tatum Buzzman here at Census. I'll answer this question. Uh, what we've done, number one, is you can actually break that out per separate line item in the automated export system. The regulations don't specifically say that. The regulations specifically state breaking it out over domestic and foreign. It does not explicitly state to break it out over the ECCN. So what we have received guidance from BIS, while this is more so a BIS requirement, a Bureau of Industry and Security requirement, is that you break out the multiple ECCNs on different line items and report it that way. And to further, just for that question too, I recommend you talk to Bureau of Industry and Security. Their number is 202-482. 4811. Our next question comes from Terry Zimmerman, Raymont Logistics. You may ask your question. Uh, yes, I was wondering if we need to file a power of attorney for a third party filing of AES. Does that need to be filed with the government as well or just on record in our own files? Um, power of attorney is on file between you, the company, and the other party. If it's an agent, if it's a foreign party, that power of attorney and written authorization is not submitted to the government. Thank you. Terry Miller, Corning, please ask your question. Hi, um, this is Terry. I would like to ask if you foresee any changes in the ways that we can access our AES data. Uh, any changes? Um, As opposed well, to writing in and requesting like a year's worth of data. You're referring to a data request. Uh, that information would come from our regulations branch. Uh, we do have Omari here as our regulations, uh, or Trade and Bunsman, who comes from a regulations background. He may be able to uh, okay. shed some light on that. I, I don't think the process is going to change. Do you report through AES Direct? Well, both. 
we um, I file directly some filings, but then we have forwarders who file on our behalf as well. Okay. I still think for the shipments you report through AES Direct on your own, you can retrieve those shipments directly yourself sure, uh, yes. through the shipment manager. Yes. Um, because we actually store those shipments online. But I don't think that the data request process is going to change. I know they're trying to consider uh, moving it online, some kind of way to submit that information where you can submit it online to us instead of a hard copy, but I, I'm not exactly sure how far along they are on that process. Okay, and I think there was some talks about um, consolidating it or putting it into the ACE system at some point down the road. Is that, do you know if that's in the works? Well, the key word you said is down the road. I think that is <laughs> that is the the ultimate goal of what the ACE automated commercial environment is to be where you can actually access all that information, but you're correct. That's something that would be um, down the road. Even though there's been movement on the export side in ACE, it's just still down the road. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next question comes from Deborah Escovito Strasva. Please ask your question. Hi. I was uh, interested in the, the code, like the port of export. Uh, when we completed on the AES Direct, um, Depending on what side of the world it's going to be going to, if we um, enter as, you know, at the port of export and it changes, would we be notified or that it is the incorrect port that of, of export marked on there? Um, are you using AS Direct to uh, submit these shipments? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Those uh, there are there are frequent changes to our code tables. Uh, ports of export uh, are one of them. Um, other changes would include changes to our Schedule B tables, carry code tables. Whenever there are changes to those code tables, those are handled automatically uh, behind the scenes by our programmers at AS Direct. So to my knowledge, I don't think we send out a uh, broadcast uh, that states that a specific change to a port of export. Okay. Um, but those code changes are handled um, automatically behind the scenes. Okay, great. Thank you. Once again, if you do have a question, please press star then one. Zareya Badeli, Pegasus 3 Worldwide Logistics. You may ask your question. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering about reporting the repetitive verify response. I was um, using a harmonized or schedule B number provided by my shipper, and it was causing um, a verify message. And I spoke with a foreign trade analyst who fine-tuned my schedule B number, but I find that I'm still getting... Um, a verify message, and I, we do these shipments about twice a month, so I'm not within a five per month parameter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this this question should be uh, directed to uh, our commodity analysis branch. Um, I would recommend um, contact from. Well, actually, we have a representative here, um, Mayumi. Would be happy to uh, to shed some light on that. Hi, Thank I'm you. Mayumi Escalante. I work in the commodity analysis branch. Hi. And actually, um, when we get those. When we get those parameter change requests, we do look at the data and see if there's any tweaking we can do. And as you mentioned, we probably did um, end up tweaking the parameters for that particular number. But unfortunately, we can't, um, we can't and we won't set our parameters so wide as to kind of accept everything. So even if we had, um, even if we had improved them, you know, in the direction of where your, where your, where your data was falling, we may not have improved it so much or widened it so much as to include all of your data, and that's just the way um, things are. So it's basically, we want to make sure that we have it wide enough to capture the majority of the good data, but we still need to keep it narrow enough to, to kind of kick out any data that's not, um, that's not within our parameters, especially if we have anything that's an outlier. I mean, there are a lot of products that are slightly more expensive than the trend, and we don't want to just widen the net to let everything in. Sure. Now, because I keep getting these verify messages, is it going in any way to affect my 100% compliance record, or should I just uh, uh, No, I, I can weigh in on that. Yeah, uh, the verify messages do not have any impact on your compliance rate. The only two responses that will affect your compliance rate are compliance alerts and fatal errors, unresolved fatal errors. Okay. All right. So those, Thank those, you. Those, those to watch out for. Sure thing. Juan Paez, 21st Century Oncology. You may ask your question. Yes, hi. Um, if we use an authorized agent, um, 
do we get a copy of the compliance report monthly, or is this something that we get uh, as needed? Um, if you are using an authorized agent, uh, is this authorized agent filing your data for you in AES? Correct. Okay, so those compliance reports will be mailed to the uh, the party who files that record. So the authorized agent will receive those compliance reports. Okay, and should they send copies of them, or only if we need them? Well, it would be, you know, when, when you are sort of uh, shopping for different uh, forwarders and authorized agents, if they do have a, a higher compliance rate, that's that is something that they use to, you know, for their own marketing, you know, to um, to show how compliant they are with AS. So that is something they can do. Um, they're not. I don't know if if they are required to. They're not required to. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Our next question comes from Michelle Pluta, JAS Forwarding USA. Please ask your question. Hi. Um, my question is. Uh, we're a freight forwarder. If we're getting a uh, power of attorney from an exporter, uh, what would constitute um, a correct party to sign that power of attorney? What type uh, of person? This is Omari oh, Wooden. Um, we really do not state in the regulations what party or what individual needs to sign it, but my recommendation is someone that is at least a high enough authority to be accountable to that export transaction. It could be okay. a compliance manager, a director of compliance, um, an export manager. That's who I think you would want to sign the documentation so that that company is aware, okay, here are export requirements that we're involved in. Great. Thank you, Mary. Yep. Rebecca Kubicek, please state your company name and ask your question. Hi, this is Becky Kubitschek from Emerson Climate Technologies, and my question is kind of a follow-up to an earlier question of a few moments ago with regard to obtaining AES data. We do file AES direct um, as a self-filer, um, but we do have numerous instances where we also use agents to file on our behalf, and we also have routed export transactions. My question is, is there anything in the works to be able to get real-time visibility like we have for filing our data through Shipment Manager to be able to see who else is filing on our behalf? Because we still remain the U.S. PPI, so we obviously have a vested interest in that transaction. But unless we file it, we cannot currently see that data. Well, uh, this is Omari Wooden again. Right now, again, that will probably be something that will be developed in ACE. Okay. Uh, right now, AES does not have uh, the capability to allow your forwarder to file the data and then you see the data in a real-time situation. Uh, even companies that have their own software, uh, companies can't see what they're actually filing unless they then provide them a copy. And in the regulations, depending if it is a standard transaction or routed transaction, yeah. then you get back either the data elements or a copy of the transaction. But right now, that real time, just the, the capability in AES just does not exist for that. Okay, just as a follow-up, make maybe sure I'm understanding this. Maybe real-time was not the, the right terminology. I mean, we can go into Shipment Manager and pull up data from the previous month, like if we were doing a monthly audit of all the filings that were done with ourselves as the U.S. PPI. Currently, we cannot go in to the Shipment Manager as the U.S. PPI and see filings that were done by other filers, even though we remain the U.S. PPI. Is that a true statement? That is a true statement because the only thing that you'll see in the shipment manager is who is actually filing the data. Yeah, As Nadal okay. mentioned about the compliance report, whoever is the actual filer that right. actually sees it. So, right, you cannot see what your forwarder filed on your behalf in the AES thread because when you log in with your username and password, that is only to your information. When your forwarder logs in, that is only to their information. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Mary Jane Boguski, uh, Intest Corporation. Yes, hi. Um, my question is about the routed export um, codes, um, because I, on the responsibility of saying that the uh, foreign principal party provides the information that um, is that needed to to put it as a routing trans transaction. So. Is that where, if they do not do that, then it is not a rally transaction, correct? 
Okay, this is Omari Wooden again. Not to get too far off the scope of the webinar, but a routed export transaction is defined where the foreign party selects or authorizes a U.S. agent to facilitate the movement and to file a yes. That is what creates the routed export transaction, whether yes or no, is this routed or not. Then when it comes to the data elements, then the U.S. party, the U.S. PPI, U.S. principal party and interest, they have the data elements to provide to that agent. The agent has logistics data elements that they are providing. So it's really who is controlling the movement. So is the foreign party selecting that agent and then they are controlling the movement, then it's a routed transaction. If the U.S. party is selecting the agent and the U.S. party is controlling the movement, then it is not a routed export transaction. Okay, so you mean if if they've already said who they want to use as the foreign, um, uh, foreign agent, the forwarding agent, then it's not considered? Then it is considered, correct? Then it is. If the foreign party is selecting the agent, then that would be, in general terms, beginning the dynamics of a routed export transaction, yes. Our next question comes from Susan Barrett, CRC Industries Incorporated. Please ask your question. Yes, good afternoon. Our question is, um, we often have samples that we ship along with our orders, and we're wondering um, if we are to, I guess, include those samples with the actual uh, filing. Um, the question, this is Omari Wooden again, the question with those samples are they coming back into the United States, or are they actually going to stay abroad? They are staying abroad, sir. Then, yes, you would need to report them. If they are above $2,500, you would report them as a separate line item uh, for whatever, like let's say it's a machine, and then you're sending something else with it as the sample. You would report those. under the $2,500 value. Okay, so then that those samples wouldn't be reportable because they'd be under $2,500 per the Schedule B classification of Okay. Very good. Thank you. Now, if they're licensable, then regardless of the dollar value, you'd have to report them. No, none of our products are licensable. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. The last question for today comes from Nina Ruska, Precision Turbo and Engine. You may ask your question. Thank you so much. On the uh, AES compliance report, we have uh, always filed with AES Direct, and we keep total control of all filings uh, in-house. But our compliance report has always been in email format. We've never received uh, a letter format. Is this typical? Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, your AES uh, compliance reports, along with your AES Federal Air reports, will be in an email format. The attachment will be in a text file, um, and that is standard for all of our users, for all compliance reports. Thank you so much. I misunderstood. I thought it was coming in the U.S. mail. Oh, no, ma'am. Sorry for the confusion. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'll now turn the meeting back to Ms. Jennifer Smith. Thank you. If there are no other questions, but um, we'll conclude today. But just as previously mentioned, Here's a list of our other upcoming webinars, and once again, the next one is on September 19, and it is on your free tools of trade, AES Direct, and AES PC link. You can register for it at the link at the top of the page starting Monday, September 10. And today's archived webinar is going to be available within 24 hours and can be found on our online press kit, which you can access from www.census.gov. With that, let me thank you for participating in today's event. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for joining us. You may disconnect at this time.